Interesting. Maybe that'll be better. Uh, my name is Daniel Young. I'm the owner and founder of Adaptive Perspective and the Adaptive Perspective social media platforms. Um, this video talks more about closed-end funds and our strategy investing through closed-end funds. If you want the full methodology and our 12 steps to financial freedom, then head over to Facebook and check out my page, Adapted Perspective, and Navigate Your Finances, where I give you the entire framework for free. Uh, I've reordered this video a little bit. I've changed the order from past videos. Um, Tempt is to be a little bit more laid back, which I think I'm pretty laid back in general, but I, I wanted a more... I don't know. I wanted, I wanted a different look. So uh, reminders, this is an unedited video. Who knows what you'll hear in the background as I film these in my house. I'm not a financial advisor. I am a financial strategist. And I don't speak like the herd. And I walk in limited company and sometimes I walk alone. And I'm completely okay with that. Uh, we, we have two portfolios. We have the portfolio managed uh, at Morgan Stanley from a guy that I like, but whose strategy is very different than ours. And then we also self-manage a portfolio that we're building on Weeble, whose strategy is ours. And what I dislike about the Morgan Stanley structure, because I'm sure it's not just our guy. And I like our guy, but it, it's a very different strategy. It's the growth of stock projected over the long run. And if you can find a dividend, that's great. It's built on the, it's built on a, on a bad model. It's built on the 4% rule, which I've talked a lot about in previous videos. It's also built uh, somewhat on that 60, 40 stock to bond principle, which isn't needed. Uh, but the, the biggest thing is, uh, growth of stock versus dividend. And our self-managed portfolio is dividend focused. Now it's also stock growth focused. I mean, everybody wants to gain value in what you buy, but it's dividend focused. Uh, and, and there's a strategy in that that I'll explain. So if you had Apple and somebody said, hey, Apple's going to grow 10% in the next five years. Okay, great. So you can break that down however you want, but let we'll keep the 10% in five years. Will they pay a half percent dividend? And if you think the Fed is right in hoping for a 2% level in, of inflation, that's great. But I, I think it's closer to 4% on a good year. So at that 4% level, you're losing three and a half percent of your value every year. And inflation doesn't just eat your money, it devalues money. So you're devaluing your portfolio, buying something that pays less than a 4% dividend because you're not even breaking even with inflation. So if you're losing three and a half percent a year over five years, then you're losing 17.5% of your money every single year. Well, over those five years, so 3.5% a year times five, you're losing 17.5% of your value at the end of five years. But what the, um, forget the term, the, the gloss over is, well, the, it's gained 10% in value. Well, that's great, but you're, you've lost 17 and a half percent of value. So you're, you're actually losing seven and a half percent unaccounted for just by inflation. So if we change the strategy where we can still get access to Apple, but not pay in Apple, uh, that, pay, that buy in Apple price, uh, actually get a solid dividend and still get growth of stock. That's a good deal. So there's this corner of the market called closed-end funds. And it's closed-end in that it's a closed system, meaning there are only a certain level of, or a certain amount of shares, and there are not magically more shares. So if Apple ever ran out of shares, 
Apple could magically pick a new share out of the air, write it on a sticky note, hand it to you, and it wouldn't impact all the other shares in existence. But in a closed-end fund scenario, there are only so many shares. So when it's really hard to find shares, that drives the cost up. And when there are a ton of shares available, that drives the cost down, just like supply and demand. Hmm. Try to close a window, doesn't work. All right, so, so if I'm going to invest in closed-end funds, if I'm buying tomorrow, where am I going to invest? Now, the long-term uh, situation that we have to work out is what to do with that account at Morgan Stanley. For right now, it's just going to stay there. Uh, and not that, I mean, I get, I get that the longer it stays there, the more it's losing money. <laughs> but for right now, it's going to stay there. Eventually, I think we will repurpose that account and put uh, put some of that into this system and also buy real estate with it. Now, why do we have it? Long story. We'll just say uh, that's where a lot of the inheritance ended up. And it's in a much better position now than it has been in the past. Uh, but yeah, so a as it pertains to this and closed end funds, it, if I were in, if I were buying tomorrow, where would I buy? What would I buy? So before I answer that, and I will answer that, let's look at some numbers and overall opinions, uh, uh, say outside of me. So if you look at the macro and the micro markets, uh, core inflation data, whatever that means, which I get what it means. The thing is, the Fed is using all of these metrics and numbers and all this stuff of outdated data to look at inflation. And they'll say, hey, we kept inflation the same for a month. It even dropped a little bit if you look at these numbers. And if you carry that over for a year, then it'll look like we actually lowered inflation for just last month or the last two months. That's great. But for you and me, uh, costs at the grocery store are still rising, depending on what you're buying. Now, eggs aren't $10 a crate like they used to be. That's come down, thankfully, but it's everything else. Inflation is still high, regardless of what little mathematical tweaked formula they want to run. Inflation is still high. So the uh, uh, shocking data that inflation rose in January uh, was not shocking to me because costs are still rising. So if you look at core inflation data that rose in January, do you really believe the numbers? I mean, the Fed said we printed $4 trillion in about four to six months, and we had no idea that would devalue the dollar. Think about it. If you introduced $4 trillion of currency in less than a year, would that devalue make your dollar worth less than what it was originally? Yes. So why lie about it? But now the same people who, who caused this problem of inflation are also the same people tasked with fixing it. It's a better job than being in weather. Weather changes every day. You could predict that pigs will fly tomorrow and be like, oh, look, that front didn't happen. I guess we'll look and see what happens next weekend. And you keep your job. The same thing is true for the Fed, except they're manipulating currency. On that, they've stalled interest rates. Now, to regain control of the monetary supply, they started upping rates, right? fastest rate hikes in history it takes three to four months to figure out if one rate hike has an impact but instead we're raising rates every single month so we stalled rates and some people are predicting a lot of rate cuts this year but with the inflation rise in january no inflation cut for right now or no rate cut for right now so first quarter yeah, no rate cut. Me, I think it's in April or May, maybe, right? If not, then then after summer, but we'll see. Uh, I for sure am not predicting six rate cuts like I've seen across the market, but I, I think they'll cut it a little bit. Uh, in the midst of the rate 
uh, say in the midst of the rate stall, you've got green investors like new money, plus that 60 order advisor scheme waiting on the Fed on the Fed to cut rates, like waiting, bouncing, waiting. But I think they're waiting too long right now. Like I think they're hoping for it to be tomorrow, which we know it's not going to be tomorrow, but I still think it's going to be a while. So factor that into everything else. Bloomberg, um, who's lately pushed to hop uh, lately pushed everybody to hop into the bond market. But they're generally late to the party. You've got the contrarian outlook team, who I trust more than anybody. They're actually split on whether you should sit and wait or buy. Uh, Seeking Alpha, which I don't pay for their service, but I, I see a ton of it on my account in Weeble. Uh, they look at the stock market in general, but they're also looking at closed-end funds like their single stocks. And that's like comparing apples to watermelons. Uh, the only thing I watch on CNN is the fear and greed index. And it's, I think, to, I think it's a really good metric on the market, but I don't also don't think we ought to get trapped in the numbers. Uh, and then me, I look at Facebook marketplace almost every day. And I, I like furniture and antique furniture because I like facing it, I like restoring it. I also look at cars because my wife and I love classic cars. And even if we aren't buying, like we're, we're not in the market to buy a classic car. It's still fun to look on there because you can see, yes, what's on there, but also see a lot of cool things that people have done. You see a lot of bad things that people have done. It's like walking into Walmart. So it used to be pretty thin. Like you, if you were targeting a specific vehicle out of a specific, specific time frame, you might go a couple months before you see that. But right now there are so many car toys on Facebook Marketplace. And as our mechanic said best, people sell their toys in a recession. And right now, regardless of how culture spends it, regardless of how all these investing uh, talk shows spin the numbers and spin the terminology, the economy is slowing. And people feel that, just like they feel inflation when the Fed goes, hey, we fixed inflation. If you look at it from a year's perspective, not, not today's data, if you look at it from a year's perspective, we're doing pretty good. And everybody's like, well, that's great, but we're still in the midst of right now and inflation is still high. People are starting to find the same thing true regarding their toys. So people sell their toys during a recession. So I think we're at the forefront of that. As the economy slows and as we truly hit the recession in general, people will start to sell their toys more. And that'll also weigh on the market and where you think the market will go. Um, so knowing that, where does that leave us? So it, it comes down to strategy. More importantly, it comes down to your strategy. Do you know what that strategy is? I mean, everybody's got an angle. Do you know what yours is? Are you buying low and selling high? Are you dollar cost averaging or DCAing your funds? Are you investing for the short term? Are you building or what are you building? I mean, yeah, you're building funds and you're collecting funds and building a portfolio, but what are you really going for, right? What's the end goal? And that's a good mark to then transfer into what we're going to do. So, have you ever heard from heard this from Warren Buffett? I've said it on other videos. Have you ever heard this quote from Warren Buffett? You want to buy stocks for 66 cents instead of a dollar. But can't, and that's where his quote ends. You want to buy stocks for 66 cents instead of a dollar. But you can't do that in the regular market. You can't buy Apple at 33% off, 34% off. You can't buy Coca-Cola at 34% off. But you can in the closed-end fund market space. So our goal is to supplement or fund a retirement through dividends and not the gradual sell-off of funds. And we're not using the 4% rule because that's broken. The guy who invented it already said it doesn't work. We're not going to use the 60-40 system. We're 
not going to use the advice of that talk show circle junkie syndicate, like that same group of guys who could be an expert or girls who could be an expert on stocks, who then could be an expert on bonds, who then could be an expert on cars, who then could be an expert on something else hitting all the different shows, talking about all the same things and giving you the really bad advice wherever you look. We're not going to take their advice. So it comes down to this. Are you willing to forge a path away from that herd and their single stock fool advice? Or are you willing to stay in the mix and continue to get their advice and have choppy performance in how you do? So in my opinion, my opinion, you'll have choppy performance on the front end. So the, the talk show guys give advice like Bloomberg, which I'll, I'll talk again in a little bit. Bloomberg is like, hey, the bond market's really good, but you should have been in the bond market nine or 12 months ago. So you're pushing a lot of new investors, a lot of green money, which yeah, money's green, but a lot of green investors into the market right now and they're buying bonds. And it's shooting up the the. So it's pulling back supply. It's shooting up the overall value of the bond market. Okay, well, that's great for somebody who's been in the bond market for longer than now, but it's also not the time to buy bonds right now, right? The talk show guys are generally late to the party and they're giving you the advice you should have heard nine to 12 months ago. So you might see some performance off of that. You might see some good off of that. I don't know. But in the long run, their strategy doesn't work. The 4% model, <clears throat> you're hoping the stock market gains 4% at least a year. You're hoping to uh, time the, the 4 4% 4 is, one, you got to have a million dollars invested, right? Because if you, if you have 4% of a million a year, you're taking 40 grand out of the market a year and using that as your retirement or you're supplementing your retirement with that. And you're also hoping the market gains 4% a year. So you're, you're neutral in your expenses. Your million dollar portfolio stays intact. But inflation is 4% a year. Not all your stocks are going to pay dividends. Uh, and, and the value of things, right? That choppiness. So as you dollar cost average your way into a million dollars, you might have to reverse dollar cost average, right? Like dollar cost is you're buying lower than what your current average is. So if your current average of a stock is 10 and you're buying it at 950, it'll bring down your cost overall. But when you sell, sometimes you have to sell when, when that stock is lower than when you bought it. So you're not getting the best deal. Um, that that talk show syndicate is pushing outdated advice and they're using outdated strategy. So it's not helping you in the short run. It's certainly not helping you in the long run. So you can follow their advice or you can choose to forge a different path away from the herd. And that's where we are. So our our court board, our, our like our plan, our strategy is to use our strategy, which I'll get into. Uh, but use the strategy unless you have a pretty darn good reason for not using the strategy, which I'll also get into. We want to target monthly dividends unless we find an amazing deal on a quarterly player. We want bonds if we can get them super cheap. But bonds were the place to be about a year ago. So targeting them right now is kind of hard. It's still available, but it, it's not as easy as it used to be. So normally when something goes out of style, like it's not the fad for investing, the market drops out, that circle group isn't interested in, them, they're steering people a different way. And when, when the value drops out because it's not a favorable thing, that's a good time to buy uh, I look at energy infrastructure, so oil, liquid natural gas, energy transfer, utilities, all of that, if you can get them super cheap, which is hard right now. But if you think about how much technology has invaded the world, 
and know that all of that ongoing technology needs oil and all of its byproducts, oil is a good place to be. So the, the areas that aren't as challenging, right? Because they haven't hit that mainstream push. Uh, data and data management, uh, cloud tech, because you need all of that to operate and house and safeguard the other part of technology. Everybody looks at NVIDIA, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. They're giant companies, they're icons, but who manages all the data? If you don't have a great server, a great data management team, none of that other stuff works. So if you've seen Matthew McConaughey's new commercial, uh, it really is. It's a technology gold rush. And your data is the gold. Uh, you look at, you could look at real estate, real estate investment trust, convertibles, uh, with the hoped for coming rate cuts. If you can make a profit in the existing real estate market with 6.5% interest rates, if you can make a profit there, then you will for sure make a profit with a lower interest rate. Uh, convertibles where you can switch between stocks and bonds pending the metrics you need, or if you your company can meet different metrics. That's a really good place to be in this market. The other one is preferred. So if the economy is slowing and it's going to be hard to, how do I say this? The economy is slowing and companies are, uh, say if companies cut dividends, if they're low on funds, they have to pay preferred shares. The common shares might get paid, right? And should get paid because there ought to be money left over after the preferred shares, but the preferred shares take preference, take precedent over the common shares. So a company stocked on preferred shares sounds pretty good in a slowing economy. So backstory done, when I share my screen, you're gonna see a few more tabs than normal. Let's see. All right, so the fear and greed index, not that, like it's it's that weird thing of, I think you can use it to your benefit. I also think you can get trapped inside of it. When things are in extreme greed, you have a lot of new investor, a lot of money, a lot of green money into the market, it's driving up the cost of things, right? That can be great for your portfolio. It can also be hard to buy stuff depending on what you're getting versus when it swings back, which could be, oh, well, there's a lot of fear, a lot of hype regarding the ending of the emergency funding following that Silicon Bank emergency. Uh, I've seen a lot of hype regarding uh, like a possible rush on cash um, if that happens and that pendulum swings back into extreme fear, fear, right? When people get scared, people pull out of the market, all that green money gets scared because their money's getting devalued. When things transfer into this area and the value of stocks drop, that's a great time to buy because they will go back up. All right. So that's over. We'll get into these tabs here in a little bit. So this is the already ranked closed-end fund master, but now scaled back into alphabetical order. So everything in gray doesn't meet our standards. Everything in purple is recommended. Everything in blue we own. Everything in green we track for one way or another. Everything in white just kind of falls in the neutral, not interested ground. Uh, asterisk. Triple asterisk is a buy alert. It, Closed-end funds sell for discounts. You can see what the portfolio is valued. You can also see what it's selling for. And every fund's discount or every fund's pr premium is relative to just that fund. So if we said neutral is a dollar, if you're spending a dollar, you're getting a dollar's worth of shares. Uh, or it's equal trade. The fund is worth a dollar and you're paying a dollar. Uh, but there are some funds that you can get at a discount. Actually, there are a lot of funds that you can get at a discount. Now, some of those discounts never really change. It's like it's like the going out of business sale tomorrow. Tomorrow never happens, right? So that sale just kind of keeps on going. Uh, 
So some funds are 20% off, but they're always 20% off. It's not really a great deal. Uh, sounds amazing, but it's not really a great deal because the value never changes. Uh, there are other funds that increase that window, increase that discount window, then they gradually shut it. And as they shut it, the price rises. And if they can increase the dividend, then the price rises faster. So the discount to net asset value is what we're looking at. So these funds that are marked, the current discount of that fund is double the historical discount, different management, different strategy, important to look at the overall historical data. But it's also important to look at the short-term data, the five-year data. So the funds that are triple asterisk are double the discount of the historical average, and they're greater than the five-year discount. Two asterisks is a dollar cost average based on what we already own. One asterisk is tracking for whatever, for whatever reason. So if we scale these by discount, Uh, our, our focus is monthly. So annuals out. Um, we also have some other parameters, but this fund, for, yeah, formerly this, discount window never really closes. It got rebranded, but nothing's really changed. Yeah. So if we scale these and asterisks, this becomes our focus group. So we come to this tab. Current would be if we currently own it, how many shares do we have? So all of these targets are uh, significant based upon the existing fund. Like it's not comparing these two funds together. It's data comparing this fund to itself. So what we've been trying to do is unless we find just a stellar quarterly payer, we've been focused on monthly payments, monthly dividends. Right, shorter list. We've also been focused on 9% or above. Now, there, there is one exception that's obvious one, and two, I think, that are not obvious. But municipal funds get a slightly different moniker. Let's see, there's one. Taxable equivalent yield. Right, so the tax equivalent yield of this is pretty high. That being said, I still don't know much about municipals, so I have a really hard time encouraging somebody else to buy one. All right, this fund stays on here because it is the steepest discount it's been in a long while. And it's because two things. They changed their portfolio. They were heavy bond, and in the coming rate market, coming real estate, uh, interest rate cut, they switched their portfolio from bonds to uh, senior loans and real estate. And in doing so, they could not maintain the dividend. So they cut their dividend in half, like quite literally in half. So their former yield was 14%. It was unsustainable. And when they cut their dividend and said, hey, this is, you know, essentially they haven't come out and say, said, this is what we're doing and why. But it, it's, you can see what they've changed their portfolio into. And they cut their dividend and the price fell out. Like it was upper sevens, low eights. And then they changed their portfolio, cut their dividend and the price fell out. So this would, this would be that, uh, you know, it, it follow the strategy unless you have a really good reason not to. The fact that the discount is so steep and the dollar cost average is so significant would tempt me to break that. And I get that this doesn't meet our 9% strategy, but if the dividend comes back at all, it will. 
Um, but otherwise, there's really only one other fund that's tempting. Well, I'll, let me rank these in reverse. So if we employ the, the overall strategy, let me back up even. So if we look at our strategy, right, significant discount, first and foremost, with monthly payment and ideally a 9% yield, this one would stay. The only, I won't say the only, There, there's a couple things on this list that are interesting, but only one really fits the the overall added strategy. So if you look at bonds, real estate, or bonds, oil, data management, real estate, and convertible, and then preferreds, of those five, you have, cons it, it's a, somewhat of a portfolio when it can, but it's not those things. And I'm like, I understand consumer stuff, real estate consumer to a degree, but it's not me. Uh, of these others, right, municipal, but I don't quite understand that. It's also on the high end of things of where I like to be. Municipal, but still less. Right. Preferred yields, yes, but not at 9%. Not at 9%. So we'll cut out those. And outside of this one, that hits our, well, BRW, uh, used to be loans that love the aggressive Fed, but they've changed their portfolio. They've still got loans. It's like 50-50. It's loans, but it's, they've built their, their own independent closed-end fund portfolio, uh, which is good because it gives, it gives us a lot of access to funds that we don't have, but at the same time, not all of those funds are funds that I would own anyway. So it's kind of hit and miss, but that leaves us with this. So if we think back to the overall strategy, bonds, so you end up with convertibles. So convertible between stock and bond. And that's what I have to pull up here. My mistake, and I'll own the mistake, is buying sister funds that do the exact same things. Uh, and that's hindsight. Like we, we bought NCZ at the beginning of our self-managed portfolio journey. We bought NCV more recently uh, in comparison, and I like the V better. But, uh, this is NCV. So if you look at how this is structured, it's the same thing. Slightly different, but it is the same thing. And to own two of the same thing, to me, just it, it's... Like, why not just be invested in one? So it, it's on my sell list to sell one of these funds. Uh, but you get the bond status. Um, there we go. Uh, based on our portfolio, this one has performed better. Uh, we bought them for near the same cost, about three three eighty a piece. We own the same amount. We own two hundred of uh, two hundred of each. Uh, I really think just the dividend alone makes this one perform just a little bit better overall uh, on a overall return of investment, but it's really just the same exact fund. So I would get rid of that. One. So bonds, when we can find them cheap, uh, energy infrastructure. So oil of the oil funds we own, uh, KYN is still a triple asterisk, but the window's closing. 
uh, and it it's a quarterly payer. We already own 250 shares of it, if not uh, maybe 300 shares of it. You can go back and look. 400 shares of it, yeah. Uh, we're good there for a little while. Uh, so bonds, energy infrastructure, data management, that would be HGLB. Uh, with energy infrastructure, that's utilities, that's HGLB too. Uh, and then you look into data. All right, so bonds, energy infrastructure, data management, real estate, and real estate and convertibles where you can switch between stocks and bonds. And then lastly, preferreds where you get the preferred dividend ahead of the common shares. So that's the top four. Um, and if I had a thousand dollars, which we don't, but we could if we sold part of our portfolio, which I can get into that strategy. Uh, I'm split between doing this this way. So this is what we have. We don't own this one. I'm split between the strategy. I, I only buy in sets of 50. So we could buy right? $900 worth of, of stock and get a decent dividend. Uh, almost a, we'll say a little bit over a 9% dividend. You, we could also do this and get pretty close to the same dividend. So if we go back <laughs> Of the current list of what's up here, the only ones we could buy, the only one we could buy a set of 50 of is this, bonds and convertible, convertible in bonds. But do I, do I actually have a top? Like, Would I pick one of those four over the others, knowing all the macro and micro data I listed out, plus knowing our overall strategy and how it relates to our current portfolio? Could I pick just one? If I had to buy, I would buy here because that's what we have. But truth be told, I wouldn't, me personally, we're not buying tomorrow because and I can close these out. Uh, because of that CNN data, it's tempting to sell some stuff just to buy this. And what I mean is, so I could, I could use the CNN data knowing that things are up in price because of those circle junkies pumping people into specific investments inside the market and sell some things on our hit list that have been earmarked for a reason. This is a healthcare only fund, which is not a bad fund, but it's an automatic dividend reinvestment plan. We never see these dividends. They pay them and then they take them back and they end up giving you more stock in, uh, I say in lieu of the dividend. So you're automatically buying more into the stock every dividend payment it makes, which helps you in the long run. Like if I if I take off the 7.7 .7 that we've gained, it it decreases or however you want to, lowers our overall return. Oop, go back one, two, right? So with the added shares, we're only down over, overall ROI is 11. Without them, we're in the negative. Right. So there's a there's a reason behind it. But having the company reinvest that dividend instead of us getting cash in hand dividends doesn't fit with our desire to have dividends in hand. And 
this company and this company are automatic dividend reinvestments, which are great whenever you sell it. It's not great in the meantime because it's not cash in your account. So given the state of the market, it is tempting to buy this and then reinvest in one of those two strategies or I guess reinvest using one of those two strategies, either buying those three funds or buying that one fund. And the other funds up for up for sale or up for earmark this, because it it's a duplicate that has not performed as well as the other. Uh, we bought it first. And this, and when I say this is our portfolio, this is everything we've bought when we've bought it. These are all the metrics uh, in complete transparency. This is everything. Uh, last time we bought it 22 last time we bought it 23 i mean we bought this later it, there's about two percent there's about two cents different in overall share price but if we look at the overall numbers this one's almost break even compared to that one's eight percent down which i really think it's just down to the dividend so selling this would be a bigger loss, but not much overall. Uh, so this one's up for earmark. The other is this fund. This fund ought to be crushing it based on their portfolio. It pays quarterly. It's been a fluctuating dividend. It's slightly higher. I want to say it was uh, 0.1064. Uh, three months ago, whenever it paid. Uh, it's slightly higher, this next payment. But if you look at their dividend history, really the last seven years, it is a continual slow slide down. And it, it's a technology fund. What do they have? Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA. Like all the technology firms and we're in the midst of a technology boom. And they have not regained stock price and their dividend has been sketchy. So, I mean, I would love to wait for 20%, but I mean, because all of these are earmarked, I mean, like sell at 20%, sell at 20%. I would love to wait for 20%, but it's tempting to use the fear and greed index data and in that things are higher than they normally are right now. Like the current pendulum of things, right? It's currently high. Use that to our advantage. Take the profits or just take the losses. Not reinvest all the money right now, but reinvest some of it. Let it sit, do the same thing next month and then see that where that takes us. But then we get consistent monthly dividends uh, overall, we get a better yield uh, and we get a better, it's not that healthcare is not great. It's not that technology is not great, but we get something that's built for, for the long haul and not just the current situation of things. So I don't know if I could pick just one of these. If I absolutely had to, like if you were going to, if I had to force, if you were going to force me to invest, I would pick what I had to make. Uh, pick what I could buy 50 shares of. But I think the, the strategy of this, uh, these are the four top dividends, or not four top dividends. It's the four current funds that meet all the metrics now outside of this one. So, uh, but we're playing the discount game. We're looking at monthly. Overall, we're looking at the yield uh, in that one, th one fund, HFRO doesn't have the right yield but it should go up. Uh, but we're also looking at those specific subcategories. So bonds, these two, utility and energy infrastructure, here, here, uh, PDT to a, to a degree, uh, based on what they have in their portfolio. Uh, so bonds, energy infrastructure, 
data management, that is for sure HGLB. Uh, then you look at real estate and uh, convertible. So that's real estate, convertible, real estate. And then you also look at preferred shares and that's BDT. So we kind of cover all the metrics with just four funds. Uh, so I would either A, put 50 shares into the funds in blue or B, get 100 shares of the one in purple. But it still comes down to your strategy, what money you have and what you're looking at overall. This is our strategy. What's yours? Do you really know what you're buying and why? Do you really have a long-term game plan? Do you really... Um, like, do you have the metrics of what you're trying to find in your portfolio down? If we go to the bottom, I want to say our portfolio on Webull is, and yeah, with the market, we're down maybe 8%. It's gone down a little bit, or it's gone up a little bit. Um, I mean, we're in that choppy market because people were suddenly surprised by the increase of, of inflation. If they had asked you or me, we would have told them it's gone up. Uh, but overall, we're up 15% in just two and a half, maybe two and three quarter years. Uh, that's the current average average yield of our portfolio off of that much invested total. Uh, the annual dividends skew just a little bit because some of these funds pay uh, hidden dividends, like they'll, they'll cash out dividends at the end of the year. Uh, but this has been our system it, uh, to raise our overall yield to something that's sustainable, right? So around 10%, right? Nine, nine to 11, nine to 12%. Uh, that number will grow as we go. E even if all of these funds stayed the exact same in price, we would get paid dividends and that number would grow. Uh, and then calendar wise, of what we're projecting every month, the goal is to continue to raise our monthly dividend rate. So that's our lowest paying month, just based on when we get paid and how we get paid. So if we can continue to raise this amount, we will raise every month. Um, there we go. So those are the top four. I don't know if I could pick just one. I, if I had to, it would be the top one because it's what we could grab 50 shares of. Uh, better strategy using our 50 share metric. It just makes it easier math for me. Uh, if you had $1,000 or maybe if I had $1,000, I would invest in that. Now, the, the advice with this is I don't want, well, so if I ever made this a membership, that's why it's called a membership view, I would market the data in the spreadsheet. I don't want your money in your investing. I want to help you learn how to invest your money in your self-managed portfolio. I don't want to, well, one, I can't legally, like I can't take your money and invest it for you. Um, if we were friends, I, I, that would still be weird. That would be me having your account info. That just doesn't sound uh, safe for either of us. But um, I, I want to teach you how to self-manage your own portfolio by showing you our portfolio and our strategy. Uh, and it forces me to, to talk out and discuss why our strategy is built the way it is. So if I had a thousand to invest tomorrow, and we wanted to buy tomorrow, it would either be 50 for a company in blue or 100 in, for the one in purple, but we're not investing tomorrow. Um, might be selling tomorrow. Uh, the HQL fund, I think, goes ex-div in two days, so we might wait two or three days until we sell that so we get the next dividend. But um, I, I think it's worth... No, it's worth tracking. I put it that way. It, if that pendulum swings further into extreme greed and the cost goes up of things, it, and you can still snag a really good deal if you're buying. 
but it, it's almost like encouragement to sell those earmarked funds so that when the next crazy financial thing happens, whether that's the emergency funding following the Silicon Bank issue or the New York Bank issue or whatever hype we're seeing for this run on cash in a month, like whenever that happens and you get that green money sector that just freaks out because they're losing money in, in uh, the stock market, and that pendulum pivots back into fear and extreme fear, that's the time to buy if it still meets the metrics because our principles is it's got to be a significant discount. <coughs> so if all of this stayed in place and that pendulum was in extreme fear and all of this stuff was cheaper, then yeah, I'd say, yeah, that's a great buy scenario. But knowing that even though it's uh, cheaper than it has been, um, this is the debate of getting trapped inside that pendulum. Like if it's a good deal, buy it. And all of these are great deals. But at the same time, I'm more inclined to sell the earmarks than buy anything right now because I, I can kind of feel the hype. Like every time we swing into greed and extreme greed, something happens and that pendulum rocks back into fear and extreme fear. And on our end of things, it's like we buy right now and then two weeks later, we drop into extreme fear and get the same fund at 70 cents cheaper, which is not a huge difference, but it is a huge difference. So us, we're waiting. Selling, maybe. Buying, we'll wait. Uh, if you're buying, that's what I would encourage you to look at. The the stuff in blue we own, the stuff in purple is recommended. But honestly, that stuff in that one in purple. That's an interesting fund. You can find information on these on cefconnect.com. Uh, I also like to pull up uh, the, the Morningstar portfolios. So if you type in PDT portfolio Morningstar, it'll pop up their portfolio and give you an, a bigger snapshot than what you'll find on CEF. CEF's got really great advice. Uh, it's, got, it's got data in like a, a big picture. You can see stock trend, you can see dividend trend, you can see discount trend, you can see a little bit of what's in the portfolio. Morningstar has more of what's in the portfolio and not as much as the data tracking. So I, I like combination. Um, yeah, anything else, I'll just be talking in circles for a while. So we are holding, we are probably selling soon, but we are not buying tomorrow. Uh, if you like the content, consider subscribing to my channel, uh, hit the like button, head over to Facebook and join my group there called Navigate Your Finances. And the information will be below. As you face the week, really as you face the rest of the year, you need to realize where you are and you need to figure out, if you don't know, you need to figure out where you want to go, right? Because then the strategy just becomes getting you from where you are to where you want to go and beyond. But if you have no idea where you want to go, then it's really hard to go anywhere. Even if you're just floating on a ship in the middle of space, you're going wherever the wind tells you to go, right? Wherever it pushes you to go. But if you have no idea where you want to go, it's not like you're staying still. Maybe it's pushing you backwards. Maybe it's wasting your time, right? You need to figure out and acknowledge where you are you need to figure out where you want to go. And then it becomes your job to put those little dots on a map and get yourself to where you want to go and beyond that. So captain your ship. Steer it somewhere. Don't just go in circles. Don't just get buffeted by the wind. Don't just do the little stuff that just keeps you doing the same stuff. All right. If you want to backpack across Europe or fly a plane or have a hunting show or fix up cars or whatever it is that you want to do in this life. All of that exists inside the hazy horizon. No one know you don't, you have no idea what's there because you haven't thought about it. So know where you are, acknowledge that figure out where you want to go and then work your tail off to get there and make that happen. 
captain your ship. Nobody else will. And whatever all those dreams are you have, those aren't going to happen unless you actively make them happen. They're possible, far more possible than culture will tell you. Right, the, your job is a tool to help you get there. The stock market's a tool. The real estate investment market's a tool. Our fifth, our twelve steps to financial freedom is a tool to help you figure out all this other stuff. But your job is to figure out where you are and where you want to go, and then figure out a way to get there and make those dreams happen. So, your dreams will not happen on their own at all. If it could have happened, it would have happened, and it hasn't happened, right? So figure out where you are, figure out where you want to be, and then make it happen. Fight like hell, work your butt off, and make your dreams happen. So have a great week. Have a great week. I hope, I hope you make progress. I mean, it really, it really is the, the fight, the journey, the will, all of that starts and ends with you. Now, if you want help, come find me on Facebook and let's talk and get you going. And in the meantime, hope you have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.